Hey, this is Ev Ash. You're tuned to the Entrepreneur Next Door podcast. And um, I always say it's my pleasure to welcome my guests, but this is, it is special for me because I've known Adam Robinson. Uh, I think we met eight years ago, Adam. We sat in his loft in New York City. A few bedrooms were filled with tech support people. It was really <laughs> pretty amazing. And then and then we we fast forward to what we'll uncover today. So Adam, I'm going to skip over the introduce yourself. We'll, we'll get to this later because I want to maximize my time with you. Um, you 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 had a degree in economics and Spanish literature, but if I met you when you were 15 and I asked you what do you want to be when you grow up, what was the answer then? Man, that's that's a great question. I'm not sure. So I think it was probably. Um... There were these two really cool guys. Uh, you know, I'm 42, which is not super old, but still, I was. It was in the 90s that I was 15, and there were these really cool sports medicine doctors who like drove Porsches and like got to like work on the Houston Rockets' knees, you know. And uh, it just seemed like they were always upbeat. They were young looking. They were healthy, and it seemed like they really um, enjoyed their lives. And they had a lot of cool stuff, you know, cool cars, big houses, and everything. Um, and I think when I was 15, I was, I'm like, Oh, I, I would like to look like that guy when I'm, when I'm 40 or something like that. Uh, this tech thing hadn't really happened yet. Um, so, so that's at 15, that's probably what I would have said, but it was, you know, part of me wants to say it was superficial because it was kind of like they had this kind of se seemingly fast moving in, in cool life, but I actually, was also just attracted to the energy these guys had. And yeah. that was probably because they actually liked their jobs. Unlike most of my friends' parents, probably yeah. my dad as well. Like he was a, an oil trader. Like, I'm not sure. I think that if he had enough money, he would have never gone in, you know, <laughs> like if you just gave him like, whatever, call it $50 million, like to, to, to never come to work again. There's no question that he would have never gone to work again. <laughs> you know? Well, well so uh, spoiler alert, you're 42 and you back then you were looking at 40 year olds who drove fast cars and had lifestyle. Uh, and yes, it was the, maybe the lifestyle materialistic attraction, but spoiler alert, you're 42 and you can actually do this today, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> as, as modest as you're going to be. So you, I'm going to skip over some stuff. You wind up being a credit default swap trader at Lehman Brothers and Barclays right. Capital. So you become a finance guy. Mm -hmm. So how do we go from Spanish literature to Lehman Brothers? I had a a guy on that I was best friends with in high school when we were in college, I had never had a real job. I, I I ran basketball camps. I played basketball in high school and I walked on at my college, Rice University. And in the neighborhood, I was kind of semi-famous, you know, so I could like, these eighth graders would like want to take basketball lessons for me. So anyway, that's how I kind of made money in the summers. When my dad, after my senior year, was like, dude, go get a job. Like, you can't just sit around here and watch HBO all day or whatever, cartoons. Like, So that's the only thing I'd ever done up to my senior year in college and my my best friend had had gotten an internship he'd been doing like real internships every year um you know very focused on his professional life um whereas i was just like i'll make 75 dollars an hour like feeding three kids <laughs> you know like basketballs or whatever uh he got a job on the trading floor at goldman sachs in fixed income after his junior year and he called me a few weeks in and he's like dude you have to get one of these jobs like you would absolutely love the environment i think you'd do great try to get one of these jobs so it's kind of a weird time 2002 you know it was september 11th had happened nine months before um i i also was very drawn to the idea of being an entrepreneur my brother had had started his company at that point it wasn't anything it was a couple of people but still he had went to stanford and like work he worked for this guy that never finished high school and had a really interesting electrical distribution like refurbishing business he's buying circuit breakers cleaning them up and then selling them to people for the same prices as, as a new one because you can't get a new one it's like a lag 
you know, arbitrage or something. Um, so my brother went and worked for him for a year, asked for a raise, the guy wouldn't give it to him. So he starts his own company and he uses the internet and he's able to do this really efficiently because nobody else was using the internet at the time. Um, and that life was very appealing to me. Um, but, and, and I had, so in the, the, if, if you could, and you were very ambitious at my university at Rice University, you try to get a job with the big consulting firms, Bain, uh, BCG, um, and, and or the, the investment too. banks, Goldman Sachs. Lee, it was like one or the other, right? Um, and everybody kind of looked at those jobs as just training for whatever the next role was. So the consulting firms were selling you this idea that it's the best training to be an entrepreneur and that like 40% of Bain, you know, people go on mm -hmm. to, I didn't get any of those jobs. Um, somehow, you know, my brother swam at Stanford and one of the guys he swam with, his father was the former head of investment banking at Lehman. And I think this guy hit somebody in New York up and was like, somebody's going to come interview here. He comes from a really, you know, a family of achievers. It's like, give him, you know, give him a shot. So I, I didn't get any of these jobs in Houston. I go fly to New York, interview with Lehman Brothers, and the next day they offer me a job to like start, you know, to, to go into their investment banking program, which I didn't really want to do. I heard this job was terrible. And then I get to training on the first day and I'm just like, I can't, <laughs> like it's all this accounting, it's stuff that I just hate, you know, I'm like, I, I can't even imagine doing this job. So, but meanwhile, the, the trading thing was very interesting to me. So I, I, I found there's this in between position called debt capital markets where you're on the trading floor, but it's part of investment banking division. And I viewed that as like a, a springboard to a trading career. Somehow that ended up working out. And the reason was because I managed to get invited into this basketball game with a bunch of the traders before work. And I just kept showing up uninvited. So I became friends with all these guys. And they, after 18 months, got me out of, you know, I was just like, guys, like this job I have is fucking terrible. Like, can you please just get me in some other spot? And, and they were able to, it was great. And, you know, this job I had in trading was amazing for someone in their twenties, you know, uh, it ended up being the center of the universe. They made a big, they made a movie about it called the big short. It was at the center of the financial crisis. Um, you know, everybody who was doing it made millions of dollars, which was just so much, it, it was nowhere in my, re the realm of possibility at the time that I would be living like this. Um, and the whole time, these guys who I moved to New York and lived with, they started Vimeo, the video sharing website, in that loft that you saw. Yep. I don't know if you knew that. Um, I no, probably told I had you. No idea. But, yeah. No, so, I had no idea. so th th that's why I wanted to do that. Like, I, <laughs> I'm like, I want to start a company in here. This would be such a cool life. So, uh, eventually, after the crisis, that credit default swap job I had, they sort of regulated it really heavily, and it became much harder to make money. And so, the market shrank, and it's just bad environment to be in. And I had also moved to London for a year because my boss thought Europe was going to come unwound and it would be this trading opportunity like happened in the financial crisis in the US. That never happened. I came back, there were no jobs. And it was just like, all right, I have some money. I don't really want to do this anymore. I certainly don't want to take a bad job and make a 10th of what I did last year, mm -hmm. because I don't need to. So it was kind of like I conveniently got pushed out by making that move to London and coming back and there being no good jobs left because uh, like, it's so easy for them to just keep you there. <laughs> you know, like Jeff Bezos tells the story where he's like, I had this amazing job and like, they offered me more money than I'd ever seen before to stay. But I thought about my life when I was 80 and looking back to this year, would I have been happy staying at DE Shaw or taking a yo, moving out to Washington and starting this book company, which I think is a really incredible way to make big decisions about your life. I, I did not have the maturity or insight to do that at that point. It was kind of a really convenient career, you know, whatever mm -hmm. you, you want, you want to call it speed bump for me that I sort of pushed myself out in a way. Um, 
And there's another thing where everybody, when, when I showed up on that trading desk in 2003, the guy who ran the desk was taking the train in from Darien every day. And I was like, yeah, there is no fucking, yeah, exactly. I was like, and, and they're getting on the desk at like 5.45 a.m. So they're on the 4.45 train or something. I, I was yeah. like, no matter what, I will never have that. I'll, I will sooner live in the woods in Minnesota and like fish all day, you know, and live a subsistence life before I put myself and my family through that. It just, nothing about it looked appealing to me. Um, but this thing happened where all of a sudden in your twenties, you're making millions of dollars and you think it's going to go on forever. And it's like, all right, well, if I have a sweet apartment in Tribeca and I'm sending my kids to private school and a house in the Hamptons, I can do this job, you know? And I'm like, just sort of, you know, banging up to Midtown every day and, you know, don't have to do this hour and a half commute. Uh, and then after 2008, my perception, which has largely played out. I mean, I think some people at the top are still really minting it, but like, it's more kind of like it, it, an above average performer is still living in Connecticut. <laughs> I think yeah. the great guys are super rich, but like it, it normalized, you know, this, this pre 2008 euphoria um, and, and like excessive comp kind of whatever. So with that backdrop, I was like, I've saved some money. I'm just going to use it all to try to start a business in tech because I had this very insightful mentor that was like, your skills from the last 10 years, consider them useless. <laughs> we're all going to work till we're 90. Go get some skills that will keep you busy and employed until you're 90. So I was like, all right. There's only one thing that came to mind, <laughs> the internet, right? Like I had watched these guys do it. I had watched my brother do it. Um, I was like, I need to figure out how to be an internet entrepreneur. And so that was the start of a very long and arduous journey. Oh my God. <laughs> so so I, I want to jump into Robley in a second, but you, if you look back at the years on a trading floor working for the financials, there there must have been something you took away from those years, right? What was that the biggest lesson you learned? Other so than the money, in terms other than of, the money piece. Right. In, in terms of directly... I think it's, inc I got very lucky with the opportunity that Rubly presented because there was a lot of margin of error for that to work just based on where we started, which we can talk about. Um, there's very few directly transferable skills from the trading floor to Robley. There's a lot of, um, number one, I actually made a LinkedIn post about this. Number one, Somebody said this to me, and I like to 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 use this phrase. You learn how to talk like an adult, so you you assimilate yourself to this environment of highly professional, very polished people very quickly, or they just kick you out. So uh, there's all sorts of advantages to that. You know, you present yourself very well in general. Anybody who's worked at one of those banks for three years or something, like you just come across as totally buttoned up. Um, I think having traded those markets in 2008 and out of it, like th there is like, unfortunately I didn't capitalize on it from a trading perspective. Uh, but you know, you see this like euphoria in the, in the, you know, in the, in the bull market, it just, uh, the behavior is at the top of any market. Like they're doing this crazy stuff in crypto. People are thinking yeah. it's normal. Uh, and then you see the other side of it, the absolute terror of a bear market. Uh, it, it is, it, every time it happens, it's the same. The same people have fear in their eyes, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, so and, and I can just, it's like a feeling that I have inside of me. I'm like, oh, that is how it was like in 2008 at that time. Like these same people were acting the same way or like the euphoria was like just the same as 2007. So, um, and we just saw it again. So that was really valuable. Um, it, there was a, the interesting thing is you, I kind of thought that I had a better understanding of investing than I actually did or do, if that makes sense. Like you kind of know a little bit about a lot of different companies, but you know enough to not blow yourself up. 
You know, you don't really know mm-hmm. anything. Except, it, about, except it's not your money. It's a big difference, r- right? Right. Yeah, you blow yourself up to the extent that you lose your job. And so, and then the last thing I would say is, man, there is nothing like the feeling of, there was this time, you know, you kind of uh, gradually get more rope to hang yourself in this job as you prove yourself. So I think my first year with the trading book, I made $600,000 the whole year for the bank, right? And I, I don't know what I got to pay you know, whatever. I had a hundred grand base. I didn't get a big bonus. The next year, three or four months in, I was doing incredibly well. I was already up a few million dollars, which for me at that stage in my career was great. And I was long this company called Beezer and there was fraud at Beezer and I lost $8 million in a day. (laughs) And like, I just thought my life was over. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. and like I came back and I, you know, you know, so I, I made a ton of money by the end of the year or whatever, but like, it's maybe it's like the, the first time you get your heart broken, you literally think your life is over. It's like, this was like the financial equivalent of that. I was like, I'm never coming back from this. You know, there, like, I literally thought that, um, and there was another situation where, you know, I had done something stupid and my boss had a way of making you, when you did something stupid, he really wanted to like make you feel like a fucking idiot. So you didn't do it again. Uh, like I, I basically didn't speak for an entire weekend. Like we rent, I, I was in this like Hampton share with all my friends and I was just like sitting there like in the corner, like I couldn't even speak. I'm like, I just don't know how I'm ever going to get out of this. So a few situations like that were incredibly valuable lessons. And I think they've like, you know, I have a lot of, risk to uh what some people would look at and exposure to like what some people would look at and say is a very risky space that i'm in you know like technologically Mm -hmm. with data privacy and everything doesn't bother me one bit like you know and and i think that comes from going through that you know literally feeling like i have lost everything you know which you would say isn't accurate but like at the time it kind of was it's like you know I, i had lost uh, in you, I had lost more than I had ever contemplated before, you know. Yeah, and um, and and the reality that, like you said about dating, or somebody breaks your heart, yeah, there's life after. Yeah, that that moment you completely in love with someone, or there's life after overnight. One of your biggest clients blew up, and that was it. So there was a way to come back from it. So I meet you in 2012, and at that point you start an email platform called Robly, R-O-B-L-Y. And I remember the first time, I don't remember how we met, but I remember, uh, and and I still wonder, why would anybody want to jump into this shark tank of email stuff where MailChimp and Constant Contact were clearly, you know, the dominant player, right? They were dominant. I, I kind of knew why, because I've used both of them. And again, as a marketing UX kind of, kind of guy, to this day, I think there are bloated, unuser friendly, too complicated systems that sell you on features that nobody ever uses. And I think yeah. so. So let me say, so you go into literally, you go into the shark tank of this email marketing with everybody uses and needs. Why? What problem uh, are you solving? So interestingly, uh, the story about Robley was my brother was using a company called RatePoint for email marketing and customer reviews. The guy that started RatePoint started it, it was like 2007 when City Search and Yelp were just getting started. And he thought there should be a merchant side review platform out there where the merchants had kind of some control over it because the other ones were just marketplaces and anyone could throw up anything about anything. and he had just come off of a sale of a business for like $150 million. Geo Trust was the business. He had been in the SSL space. His name is Neil Creighton. And classic sort of like investors are just giving him blank checks. He's, you know, came up with this product, you know, ramped distribution before there was good product market fit. The product was very hard for merchants to use. It wasn't quick time to value, just all sorts of problems. And uh, the way he had grown his last business, GeoTrust, was he was stealing customers from Verisign, like 
literally like programmatically, just like sort of, you know, using crawlers and then pinging people with email and then, mm -hmm. you know, showing them an offer and they were, they were converting. I think using the timing of SSL certificates expiring, like a very sophisticated uh, yeah. Yeah. bot that was like closing people, the beautiful machine. Um, and they were like, you know, I think they'd already raised 10 or $15 million. And they were like, man, like, this is not working. Like, can we find another way to pay our bills while this bigger vision of reviews, we sort of keep, you know, tweaking and see if we can't see it panning out. Constant Contact was killing it at the time, right down the street, the dudes in Boston. Um, so they had figured out a similar data mining strategy with Constant Contact. Mm -hmm. And this is unbeknownst to me at the time, right? Um, but they got, you know, 7,500 constant contact customers to to switch over to their service, you know, kind of similarly, just crawler figuring, you know, seeing the sign up widget on people's forms. And, you know, maybe maybe they were using some direct mail in a, in a, in a phone effort or something like that. Um, and my brother was one of the people that switched. And there was a day in February in 2012 where, um, my brother got an email and he was like, the, the email is just like the website's shutting down in seven days, like download your contacts, you know, go use someone else. So at the time he knew that I, I had decided like two or three months prior that I was just going to use all this money that I had saved to try to become an entrepreneur and figure out what I wanted to do. Um, he was like, do you want to see if we can recreate this product because I really liked it. I liked both sides of it, the review and the email. And this guy spent a lot of money acquiring customers, <laughs> Neil Creighton. So can we just go find his customers? That was a whole plan from day one. Hmm. And like reflecting on it now, there's just no way I would pursue this opportunity knowing what I know. Uh, but that started an 18 month process of trying, you know, it took us so long to get this first product up and running you know, which is so we should talk about a, a contrast of building Robly versus building get emails, which is what redemption.com is now. Um, yeah. But got it built in India, you know, then Tate, who's still my CTO, literally saw what we got built. And he's like, we have to start over. This is unusable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so like no concept, the, the idiotic things that we did. So a Neil loved the review. So, oh, okay. So meanwhile, I'm reading books left, right, and center on how to be an internet entrepreneur. And like every book that you read is almost all of them are just like sales collateral, <laughs> you know? So like you read a book yeah. on content marketing and it makes you think that if you just make a YouTube video and you put it on YouTube, that everyone will see it and they will sign up for your software. You know what I mean? So this is like, yeah. I'm reading all of these books and I'm like, man, it's going to be so easy. Like, let me just do it. <laughs> right. So, but I did. So I, I like got these three videos made by this guy. One of which was sort of like, if you like great point, you'll love Robley. The CEO, it got forwarded to the CEO of rate point somehow. And he's like, dude, <laughs> come to Boston. If you do what you're trying to do, it will not work. I can show you how to at least get like a cash flow positive lifestyle business. Come see me. It's like amazing, <laughs> you know? Um, and this guy explained his whole journey to us and basically said, look, you know, constant contact. There's a lot of things that you can build a spider and just acquire a lot of information about their, their customers. I'm not going to tell you too much because my co-founder is trying to start a data business and I don't want to just, you know, yeah. maybe you can buy data from them or whatever. Right. But just go look. And then he sort of, you know, he shared some other insights. So this was, this was the crazy thing that we, uh, at the time they had been creating a community page that had first name, last name, business name, and zip code for all their paying customers. And in that URL of the community page, there was a six digit unencrypted number that when you raised it by one, it was a dead page. When you raised it by two, it was the next customer. And there were 250,000 of these. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable, right? Like, and they were all their paying customers. So 
that is what, you know, I was going to try it anyway, but we, I don't even know if we would be here talking had that not been where we started. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That was what made Robley work. And it was a double-edged sword because, man, I, I truly believe this. Like, when you are starting, you have to niche down as much as humanly possible. And you have to do things that people are not doing. And um, competing with these behemoths face-to-face mm-hmm. uh, -face in a David versus Goliath battle is, like, you you won't win. You know, they're, like... I read something somewhere and I, I agree with it. Like once somebody has 60% market share, which MailChimp was on its way to getting at that time, constant contact was already being slain by them or whatever. But between those two, it was 80% of the market or something. Once you have players that have that much, like you need to spend three times as much as they're spending to have the same effect in the market because it's not a real network effect, but there is this very large network effect of people mm using it and talking about it and this, that, and the other. So she's a lot more expensive to, to, to make your way in. Um, it was a double-edged sword because that list and then figuring out how to call through that list. And we ended up getting like 5,000 of their customers or whatever. Um, it got us to a cash flow positive lifestyle business, but it was for a mass market product that we couldn't compete with from a sales and marketing perspective in the channels. I think of constant contact where the lone participant, we might've been able to figure out holes in their product to go after, but MailChimp with that free thing and like yeah. sort of as it, you know, they made this big moat with integrations and they, they, their user interface was sucked and was clunky, but I think they, they were really good product people. And they're, it was just an amazing self-serve in terms of like, it wasn't, very intuitive, but it wasn't buggy. You know, it was, it was a really good yeah. service they were providing and the brand was excellent and they were spending a lot of money on promotion. Uh, I remember I had this moment. So, so like, but that, that was the only list of leads that we had. So when we burned through that, we basically stopped growing, you know? Uh, right, so I, I just I, want to stop for a second because to kind of summarize what you said, the you you go in and fight the two behemoth, MailChimp and Constant, um, and the way you found out how to penetrate the moat of Constant was find you found a way to pitch their existing paying customers and get them to convert. And it, it, right? I think the critical differentiator, the, the critical qualifier to that statement was we we discovered a channel that nobody else was in nobody okay. else knew about this yeah so like we were pitching this value prop of like 50 percent more opens half the price to these constant contact people and they weren't getting hit by mail you know nobody else was calling them and saying this i want to uh, i want to re-emphasize that statement i made before if we did not have that list there is no way this business would have worked because there is no way we would have gotten to whatever, a few million in revenue, trying to get customers from pay-per-click or mm -hmm. I, I don't know what else we would have done, but like, and, that's and the only the thing that I ever did to get customers that worked literally. Yeah. <laughs> and and as, as far as I remember, the thing that Constant Contact did different than MailChimp, they had a pretty effective ground troops, people on the ground who were authorized local experts, you know, local experts and district managers who went and sponsored meetings. So they, they did a lot of the grassroots work the MailChimp didn't because they spent all their money on, on the marketing end. But so and, and I think Contact MailChimp had, benefited from that constant contact educated the market. You know, they spent $50 million on this effort, this yeah. authorized local expert thing. And then MailChimp once the market was educated, came in with this freemium offer yeah. and and just took the whole market. Um, so, but but then but still, so so it's a new player that nobody's ever heard of before. Everybody's heard of Mailchimp and Constant Contact. How do you get them to to convert? I mean, they don't know anything about you, right? An email back then, before social media blew up, was a critical, probably the most critical aspect of marketing. 
right? So it, there's a risk for somebody to move away from a constant contact where they feel maybe comfortable, shitty product, but it's fine, into an unknown. How do you overcome? How did you overcome that? And I remember you made calls, which was the key, right? It was the whole. So like, yeah, that was it. And we just hit this list over and over and over again and refined our pitch. So you could question, I think any, all of the best sales pitches that exist, some people are going to question the ethics of them. Mm -hmm. Here's what we did, and I'm being totally transparent. We would call and the first thing we would say is, can I speak to the person who manages the constant contact account. So, and we knew uh, this list, they were the paying customers. So it was like the connection rate was incredible. You know, yeah. if you know the business name and you know the person's name and you know the zip code, you can get the phone online. All these SMBs and they pick their phones up too. Like our customers now, they don't pick their phones up. The These yeah. big Shopify stores, you can't get to the founder from a phone call. Um, But those guys pick their phones up. So that was step one. And then we would make this very large claim at the time. So, so I would, there was this guy who's kind of spammy using Robley. And I saw that he was, he would send, and then he would send the next day to the people that didn't open the email from the day before. And he'd get a lot more opens and he'd do it again. And I was like, man, that's a great strategy. Tate, can we make this like a product? Cool. Let's call it open gen. So people wanted opens. They weren't, these constant contact people weren't selling. They're not an e-commerce platform, right? They're, they're selling to flower shops and restaurants and stuff that are just literally awareness. And, and, and that's what these people thought that, that success was. It was, they would send it out and they would see the number of people that opened it. So we had the ability to say credibly, we'll get you 50% more opens. And then we said for half the price. And this was like, I read a bunch of books on marketing, great taste, less filling, right? Like one of these uh, high low claims or whatever. And it was, it was a really effective pitch for these people. And then we would get them on a demo and we would talk about all these features we had and we'd show them a pricing page. So it started off with half price, which for anyone watching this video, there is this amazing video that actually Gail Goodman, the former CEO of Con Constant Contact, presented one time. It's called the slow SaaS, the slow SaaS ramp of death. And she talks about how hard it is to grow a small business SaaS company to scale because mm -hmm. you're getting $15 a month per customer. Like people are expensive, you know, like <laughs> How does that even work? And you know, you read these blogs like Jason Lemkin's Saster blog. This guy is just yelling about the one with SaaS in particular, figuring out how to sell at higher prices. It makes everything so much better because it's just wind at your back. And like I'm seeing it now, like that business, our 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 average subscription price started at $15 per month. By the time I sold it, it was up to 60 per month. And now we're selling, you know, a $20,000 annual contract value deal. And we're selling it faster, which is the interesting part, which is another claim that like these, these SaaS guys will say, it's like, you know, it's definitely not harder to sell a hundred times more valuable contract. It's not a hundred times harder it might actually be easier, <laughs> you know, to the right, because of to like the right, who, who, to the right audience. Yeah. Yeah. Because of who you're selling to and sort of yeah. how sophisticated they are. So I, I can attest that my journey has, has been that like, it's easier for me to sell these, you know, our team to sell these uh, $20,000 deals than it was for me to get somebody to close on a monthly for $46 a month, right? Like we're doing it faster and it's with less resistance. So we get these people on a demo, we'd show them these features. <laughs> and then here was another kind of magic part that I discovered about pricing, having read about it. So we would show a pricing page and it would have the half price price, which is what we promised in the prospecting call. It would have a price that was 
like 50% more than that. So like, you know, a 25% discount to constant contact. And then we had this decoy plan that was double the price of constant contact where you really, and the interesting thing was there was a list of features on the low plan. Then there was a lot more features on the middle plan. And then there was just like this very low touch service element on the high plan. What happened? And there's, we didn't change anything about the software. It was just worse. <laughs> so yeah. like it said that the low plan was restricted on the number of images you could store. We didn't actually ever build that. Right. So things like that. It was like, it was so 65% of people chose the middle plan. 15% of people chose the decoy plan, the high plan, which is crazy. To, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, it's like, and then the rest chose the, chose the one that we were selling before. So like, that was a mind blowing thing to me about just feeling what perceived value is and how it manifests itself. Like we did not change, you know, it's like, wow, we didn't change anything. People are kind of more happy in a weird way, paying more just by presenting this differently, you yeah. know? Um, and that's what we were selling. And it was hard. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and then, I, go ahead. Yeah. And, and like, you know, that ended. Um, and it was, you know, the, the worst. So, like, we had that list and we also had this other list, kind of a similar thing, but it wasn't as high quality, but it was way bigger. We thought we had a million business names that had signed up for free trials at, at some point. Problem with that is mm -hmm. Joe's coffee. Like there's a thousand of them, which one is it's way worse list. However, I thought that that was converting. Uh, I ramped our sales force into that. Then we got everybody on that list and like people were not even picking up the phones. So we we're just like, man, what do we do? We just doubled the size of our staff literally like two weeks ago, started an internship program, the whole thing had to fire 25 people at once. It was absolutely horrible. Uh, got destroyed on Glassdoor. I mean, <laughs> like utterly annihilated. Um, and then that started a three-year journey of how are we going to be different than MailChimp um, that eventually has led me here. And I started telling this story a little bit earlier when the call thing ran out. I was like, man, I need to figure out marketing and how to market a business. Right. So somehow landed on digitalmarketer.com. And I'm listening to Ryan Dice talk about the fundamentals of marketing. And there's this statement of value card. <laughs> and he's like, if you can't fill this out, that's your biggest problem because everything else you do starts here. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, company X helps these people, you know, buy whatever it, you know, I don't know if that's exactly it, but that's the essence of it. I could not fill this card out in a way that presented our product in a favorable light to MailChimp for anyone in any way. So if you can imagine that, I'm like, I am fucked. Like it's <laughs> like nothing we yeah. nothing we do right now is better than MailChimp literally like why would someone the only reason we have customers is because people don't know that MailChimp is free like our average customers list size was within the size of their free plan and it had all the features and they were adding features to the free plan every day um so that's what and throughout that journey I really started appreciating how powerful differentiation was it's just, this is another thing that you don't know anything about when you're like trading securities that just marketing and how it works and the psychological element of it. And it's like, you know, Seth Godin has this thing in purple calories, like milk, 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 not milk, like with the, the soy milk or whatever. Yep. So, uh, you know, I started Robley and I was like, same thing, half the price. And my entrepreneur friends were just like, I don't know about that. It's not really a good way to like go in with an entrenched competitor. Same thing, half the price. And then I'm like 50% more opens half the price. And they were like, there you go. That might work, right? Better, better, cheaper. 
yeah. same cheaper, uh-uh, better, cheaper. So, um, so yeah, I just kept trying to figure out what MailChimp wasn't doing. I took three big swings. Swing number one was attempting to go up market from MailChimp. Cause I had, I had discovered this guy who was a CEO of Mara post on a podcast. And this guy, I was getting $60 a month at the time. He was getting $9,000 per month per customer selling the same thing. And I was like, how is this guy doing this? So I hit all of his former sales and marketing employees up on LinkedIn. And I was like, I'm looking for like a paid advisor, you know, because <laughs> I'm starting a mid-market email marketing and marketing automation app, like whatever. Found this girl, Diana Ross. She's still, she's amazing. She's like my right hand, you know, she's our CRO now. She's co-founding, you know, sales or whatever. Um, she incorrectly, <laughs> well, she, she thought Marpost, Marpost at the time had done incredibly well with these affiliate guys before the email inboxes had really clamped down on aggressive email sending. And they were taking people like Infusionsoft would not let you upload a list. So right. it, just, it just was a weird, it put them in a weird position. And then MailChimp didn't have automation and Salesforce Marketing Cloud was incredibly expensive. So they were this like, thing in between that would allow you to do all this stuff. And they provided incredible deliverability support. Like they had, you know, more deliverability support than like anybody else by a long shot. And like this guy <laughs> got this business to like 30 million ARR and he was pocketing 20 million bucks a year for like 10 years. Like this guy in his young low thirties, right? He had a jet, the whole thing. So Diana was his first employee and like being around that just, I think it, you know, it gives you in, it just affects the way you see the world and that market in particular, she's like, nobody has any idea this market exists. This guy's actually trying to leave this market and go up and compete with Salesforce marketing. Cloud. So attempt number one was we tried to create something that was just above MailChimp and then a year in realized there were like eight other players that were already serving that market <laughs> much better than we ever could totally wasted a year, literally hit delete on the code. Um, attempt number two, constant contact had got acquired, uh, by endurance endurance chopped this authorized local expert program they had. And this guy reached out to me who had been running that program and was like, dude, you know, they kind of knew of me ha having been this annoying thing to them in, in the past. Uh, and he was like, this was a really effective thing for us. And what was interesting to me is MailChimp wasn't doing it. It was like somewhat of a novel thing that, you know, I was like, the math works. Yeah. They spent $50 million on it. Like maybe I can just scoop it up. So <clears throat> that was another year lost. It, <laughs> Endurance dropped it because the unit economics of it were, it was like an incredible branding thing for them, but like the math didn't work on, you know, somebody as small as yeah. we were, that's not, this is like, you know, if I did something like that now for retention.com, it might start working now, like some big branding effort, far reaching or whatever. Uh, and I would have have the money to do it but like you know i didn't have the cash flow to support <laughs> that kind of stuff and that ended up just like being so painful and i ended up getting sued and by them and because i hired this guy during his non-compete but he was california so it was like they're unenforceable but it doesn't really matter anyone can mm -hmm. sue you for anything in america god bless it um so that was terrible and then while that was going on i knew this guy ryan urban and he has this company called BounceX or Wonderkind. And he was talking to me about this identity stuff. And the way he was using it, he has really big customers. He was just using it to basically send more card abandonment emails to people who weren't logged into these stores sites, but were on their list. 
And I had lunch with him and he's like, man, I think the real money, which we can't do because of who our customers are and who our investors are, would be selling people emails of people that hit their website and don't fill out a form, which is possible, but we're, we just can't do it. And I was like, oh my God, like if I could do that, I feel like I could sell that to anybody. And at the time I thought, it, you know, I thought it wasn't can spam compliant. I like thought that the, you know, I, I had no idea how you would ever do this. And then 18 months later, after just going down rabbit holes, trying to figure out how this is done and actually even trying to resell their technology, which went nowhere. Um, I finally figured out a way to do it. And I thought affiliate senders would be the buyer. It was using third-party cookies that were due to expire in 18 months. So I was like, so there's a chance that we'll be able to do this without third-party cookies, but even if it goes away, probably sell this to these affiliate guys, make a couple million dollars, and you know I'm still better off than I am right now. And I was like, I didn't know that it was can spam compliant, but I didn't think that they would care because they were doing so much other stuff that wasn't can spam compliant, and there had been no significant can spam lawsuits, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, whatever, like, you know, and, and I was starting to get to know this world a little bit because of this Mara post connection that I had working for us. Um, and you know, the product, it just grew, it, it was a really, it's a really novel idea to people. It grew a lot. <laughs> um, but like very sort of high churn and, you know, the, the unit economics were great. Um, we were able to get it. Uh, uh, our perception kept changing, you know, long story short, two and a half years in, which was last fall, we finally realized that very large Shopify stores were our power users, never churned. They were bringing in all of their friends, not expecting anything. And they were just killing it in a way that none of these other customers who were signing up for a self-serve app were. And we had developed other features for them, uh, which made it even more valuable. So we just stopped letting anybody else use it. We're, we're, we're in the process now of getting rid of all the legacy sort of non ICP users. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we figured out how to sell annual deals and, you know, uh, now we're rapidly scaling. I got like so, 50 employees now or something so, like that. So you, you kind of, <clears throat> You kind of jumped the fence to retention.com. But I wanted to ask you two quick questions on Robly. Yeah. One, yeah, yeah, sure. One was when did you when did it hit you that it was time to exit? When so retention.com used to be called get emails. Right. So so it in was in you're doing that in parallel to when Robly was still functioning. Exactly. Well, it started as a feature in Robly. Right. It started as this is something MailChimp will never do because they can't be in this self-regulatory deliverability organization that they have to be in so that they have a line of communication with Hotmail and Gmail or whatever if they sell data. So I'll be the ESP that sells data mm. and people will switch to us. People were using the identity product and not using Robly. They were putting a, putting the file in Drip or Klaviyo or whatever. And they were saying it was awesome. So I'm like, we need to spin this out. And unlike the 18 month journey that was creating Robley's product. I didn't, this was still very speculative. So I didn't want to distract the mothership, which was like an, a, a decent cash cow. So in Snagit, which is like Photoshop for dummies, I take what needs to happen to implement this is you need to get a script on your site and drift at the time was getting a lot of traction and they had to do the same thing. I literally just like mocked up drifts UI and snag it. I got somebody on Upwork to make the Photoshop files. And then I got someone else to make the HTML that took that process took like six weeks. Then once we had the HTML, Tate built V1 of the website, which was just like sending a file, no integrations or whatever, um, in eight weeks. <laughs> Incredible. And then we launched it November 2019. 
and by the way, like I had struggled trying to do ads for Robley because like your business is stuck. Every, you know, every barber you ask says you need a haircut, right? So it's like you run into a Facebook ads guy. He's like, well, you need to run Facebook ads. You run into a UI UX agency. They're like, well, you need new, you new UI UX. So like I had tried Facebook agency over and over again, never got a single customer from them. Um, literally month that I, I, I made a video I, on digitalmarketer.com. I followed their video sales letter script, wrote it out. And I got a girl named Romina to make word art on Upwork. Mm -hmm. And I recorded my own voice on a very shitty uh, iPhone, you know, all sorts of, it was terrible quality. And we run this ad, we spend $5,000 on ads in the first month and get 10,000 monthly recurring revenue from those ads. Unbelievable, right? Like uh, just if I spent $5,000 on ads for Robley, I would have gotten a hundred dollars, like, like literally zero success, you know? So after that month, I was like, I need to figure out how to get rid of Robley and focus all my time on this new one. Got it. It was a very strong indication you know so you you said and, and i prepare for these so i watch everything you posted and read things you said when i started get emails which is retention i was burnt out from my previous startup and the plan the whole time was to sell after 18 months so yes. because my, my audience are entrepreneurs and a lot of them are founders that, that do SaaS stuff can you describe to an eight-year-old what does burnt means when I was burnt out, what was it like? Tell me how it felt. What was it like to be burnt? Yeah. So like, interestingly, this nice lifestyle business, I was single. Um, I was like making more money than I was spending. I had left New York. I didn't know where I was going to live. I was kind of doing this digital nomad thing, which is great in many ways. I accomplished retirement level goals. I was able to live in Aspen during the winter for four winters. I skied 300 days. Like I traveled all over the world, spent a year in Argentina, putting together a dev team, just this wonderful life experience. But you know, it wasn't a retirement plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like this business was going away at some point, you know, I couldn't figure out how to acquire customers. And it got to the point where it was, couldn't even figure out how to acquire customers to offset churn, you know? Uh, so that is not a great space to be in, right? It's, it's like the opposite of a growth environment. It's like stasis, and not, you know, but the interesting thing was I wasn't working a lot of hours because Anne was managing the whole thing. I was just trying to figure out what else we could do to grow it, which is not really a full-time job. But it's emotionally exhausting. You know, you try these things that take a year and they don't work. Mm -hmm. um, and we had this other situation where, you know, my brother put a lot of money into Robley. My co-founder, James, he didn't take a salary for four years. They own like 40% of the cap table. Uh, I want to do the right thing by them get emails started in Robley. I just was like, guys, let's get this thing to the same size as Robley growing at a hundred percent a year and sell it for double. And then I'm out. You know, it's sort of, I was, that was just w the position that I was in at the time, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to do, I wanted to take care of these yeah. guys. Like I, I thought Robley's going to be bigger than it was an eight figure exit, but like, you know, it, with an additional eight figure exit, double the size, like I, I felt really good about the outcome for both of these guys. Um, but I really didn't love the fact that there was this rolling 40% tax on whatever I was doing. <laughs> You know, it was like, it like got to the point where like the, the contribution was so far behind anyway, but I thought it was fair. I was like, I was like, let's just, I'll sprint for another 18 months. You know, we'll get a nice little exit with this thing. And that'll be that. Um, and that was the path that we were on. And I actually had lined up a, you know, we went through a whole process to sell it, which like fell apart February of last year. 
um, worked on a deal for six months. Uh, and in and around, you know, the, the deal fell apart and this is like the incredible story. Um, I was focused on that. This deal falls apart. Meanwhile, you definitely, unless you read this, you don't know this. I've been sharing an office since I got to Austin with the guys who started Jasper AI. It, it's on, it's my, it's my next note. Yeah. yeah. So, it, so, yeah. so I, I've, I've shared an office with them two years before they started that company. And these guys were burnt out and stuck in a way like they weren't even making money. They raised two million bucks, burnt through all of it. Like they were out of cash. Like I have a text. I need to heart it. I have a text on my phone. I was talking to Dave a lot. So in, in December, 2020, sort of middle of COVID, these guys tried something super heavy lift personalization software. No one fucking bought it. They were out of dough. They were going to sell their business and start a restaurant. And we had thought, you know, get emails at the time. Robley got to like 250 monthly recurring revenue or something. Get emails was at like 267. But like, I only had like 10 people working in total on these things. So like my life was actually getting pretty good. You know, there was a scenario in which if you had a couple more of these things, it would be fantastic by any, any sort of stretch of the imagination. So I was kind of preaching this to Dave. I was like, well, you already know how to get here. What if you, and I thought I had come up with this thing of, you know, like we built a lot of software on these identity pixels that other people had that made them useful. And the way other people were trying to sell them, they were not useful, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. I had this theory that there was a lot of tech out there that tech people had built that didn't understand user experience and sales and marketing. So we should just go find those and spin up these little SaaS apps and like have a portfolio of them. So that was a plan. And Dave, I mean, these texts that I have from him around that time are absolutely hysterical. He, he sends me this text on December 21st. Here we go. December 29th, 2020. First paying customer. Had the idea seven days ago. Hopefully this is my get emails. That's mm -hmm. Jasper, right? Unbelievable. And then I watch these guys go from zero to 50 million in 12 months. They didn't even hire anybody when they do. They just created this demand gen loop in Facebook. And then they raise $200 million at a billion and a half dollar valuation. They each take $25 million off or whatever. And Meanwhile, I'm about to sell, get emails for this life-changing amount of money for me. Like maybe I was going to make, you know, depending on how the earnout went, like 20 or $30 million or whatever. And it went away. And I happened to be scheduled to have dinner with, or lunch with Dave the next day. And it was going to be like a toast, like, man, I locked this down. I'm going to get the check soon. Like, this is amazing. And I was totally devastated because this thing that I thought that I had just got taken away, you know, and it's, I don't have that much money, like uh, barely have any, right? I mean, some people might think I do, but not like that. So meanwhile, Dave's like, man, like we're hiring these incredible people. And uh, like, I can't describe to you like how good they are and like how visionary and inspiring it is to be around him. He's, he's like, and and we were doing well at the time. Like I had gotten get emails to 8 million ARR with one salesperson in effectively no marketing spend. We did six months of ads in the beginning of the journey. It was two years in. And, you know, this thing was just like gushing out cash. And there was a lot to reinvest if you kind of knew what you were doing. Um, but my whole thing with selling it was I was kind of burnt out and I didn't have confidence in building the company myself. So I was just like, screw it. I'll take, I'll get this money. And then I'll just go do this again a few more times. You know, I had no interest in retiring, but like, I just didn't see a path to a decent life. Cause that Robley experience was just hard. I was doing it all, you know, like yeah. we needed a sales organization. So I would read a book on sales and then go try to put this together. Whereas what I have done now is hired people who know how to do this. You know, um, 
and I have very little to do with it. So Dave's like, you should talk to this guy, Shane Orlick. I just, he was the CRO of walk me, which just IPO'd and like, he's going to change the way you're thinking about all of this. So it's one 30 minute conversation with this dude. I asked him to be an advisor at the end of it. He begrudgingly was like, okay, but it doesn't take too much time. I sent him a proposal, never wrote me back, but he basically said, what you are doing is unacceptable. He's like, there is no way you should have that type of cash flow and only in growth and only have one salesperson. You have to try harder. Like, it, like you are only hurting yourself by mm -hmm. not, he's like, I'm not telling you to do what we're doing. Hire five more salespeople and just see how it goes. <laughs> you know, like just do, you know, do more like this is pathetic. Like you're not, you know, so that started this journey of, I probably talked to him in late February last year. It started this journey of trying to, I, I thought that the answer was we needed to sell larger deals and I needed to find an enterprise salesperson to build out a sales org, um, which isn't exactly what Shane is for Dave, but like, that's my plan until I met this guy, Santosh was I'm going to bolt on lone wolves to this. I'm going to create an exceptional cash flow business. Dave's going to go this venture backed route. We'll, we'll compare notes in five years on who actually had the more pleasant journey, all things considered. So that's the plan kind of went down the road with this one sales guy. He consulted for a couple months. It didn't work out. And then just sort of in trying to learn about the enterprise market, I ran into this dude Santos who builds some info and Apollo.io. Like the, after the first conversation, I was just like, if I can get this guy to work for us, like everything will have changed for me, period, full stop. Uh, I told my wife that. And then I begged him to speak to me again. He agreed. And I convinced him to be an advisor. And he's like, I don't do this like people normally do. I'll give you three hours a day for a year because I'm kind of on my way out at this current company. He was the CEO of another company. And he's like, if I like what you're doing in a year, I'll join full time. So <clears throat> within a week, he was giving us eight hours a day. <laughs> and this guy, like he's just seen the movie so many times. He's such an incredible guy. He understands every single part of the company. He started as an engineer. He was a product guy for 10 years. He started running sales and marketing teams. He's been, you know, CEO of Unicorn Company, but he, he loves the stage of product market fit, but like single digit ARR revenues in those systems and getting it to where it's like in hyper growth scaling phase. The fundamentals that Zoom Info still operates on, like this dude put in place there. So, uh, yeah, I convinced him to join in September, and he's like, you know, what are the literally conversation one? What are all the risks of this business? Okay, we need to eliminate every single one of them. And then uh, he's like, if we can get to the point where we're actually selling annual deals, then we start scaling the shit out of this thing. So, hmm. six weeks of work, October twenty fourth, sold. You know, I made this deck. Diana was three for three selling annual deals. And again, I wrote my wife. I'm like, everything has changed for me. Like, this is the most important day in my career. Like, it went from high churn monthly product to 100% close rate on an annual deal. And, you know, we're off to the races. It's like, we have a 2% market penetration on big Shopify stores. And Clayview has 90% of them. And if we can get to 15% market penetration, which like in this ecosystem, things that catch on, they really catch on. 15% market penetration gives us 250 million ARR. I like can't even believe it. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, it's like, 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 maybe it's a little bit like imposter syndrome. I don't love the way that, that is described because I don't feel like I'm a fraud, but it feels like something that I came up with. There's no way it could be that big. You know what I mean? You know, I, but like, I I'm, watched, I'm watching it, I'm watching it unfold in front of my eyes. Yeah. You know, like now I think it's inevitable. Like things don't lose momentum that are on this trajectory, you know, it's, and, it's and normally. It's interesting yeah. because I literally, before we came on, I was, 
watching a I always discover new Seth Godin YouTube videos yeah. that I miss because he's been my mentor for 30 years uh and I happen to know him but that's that's a different story and he somebody asked him about imposter syndrome and he said if you feel that way you should be proud because then you have something it, it's generated from a point of I'm doing something it's a positive thing it's not the word imposter completely yeah. excuse it you know a lot of people feel that way because i'm not deserving of where i am right and, and as you're talking and i let you speak most of the hour because your your story is phenomenal is you're absolutely not an imposter you you grounded it out and made it happen to a point of where you're at and you know guy Raz has this this podcast i've been listening to for years you know how i built this and i kind of model my style about him he always ends his his podcast with all right so adam so what do you attribute your success to is it hard work or is it luck and you know i i think it's a setup question because it really depends on the circumstances but listening to you it was mostly hard work and then you get to share an office with I mean, I love this guy. I never met. I mean, I I was a Jasper hundred dollars a month guy for a year, two years ago, because yeah. when I first came across their platform, everybody's excited about Chat GPT. These guys were so far ahead of it. Um, yeah. I loved it as a marketing guy, and I paid a yeah. hundred dollars and I watched them. You share a room with the guy that changes your life by a comment and or beating you up on your whining one day, because yeah. that's on one of your stuff. So that's, see, that maybe is the timing and luck piece, which was a, a game changer for you in the perspective of how you looked at it. But just as an aside, because I, I happen to be exposed to a bunch of SaaS guys, and they all make the same mistake. What Dave has done with Jasper, from my perspective, other than the tech part, forget about it. The thing that I loved about what he did was that every time he generated content, he was asking us, and I was a founding user, so I got the $99 whole thing. He was asking you, so if it's not, if the output is wrong, tell us. And tell me, not in a thumbs up, thumbs down, but actually explain to me what we missed. Yeah. Because his, to me, his brilliance was he was learning from his users how to improve his product. And, mm -hmm. and then really prevent churn as much as he could. I stopped using it because at some point... I wasn't getting a hundred dollars worth of value out of it, not because of Jasper, because I wasn't using it enough, right? Right. But I thought right. they were great. So um can I say I one guess... more thing about that whole situation that yeah, I think yeah, is so ahead. important? Yeah. If I were listening to this podcast now and I were a SaaS guy who was not me, and I heard that story, I wouldn't have thought that it applied to me. There's something about how close of peers Dave and I were and that I was sitting in the room with him that made me think that it was possible for me to create a large unicorn status company. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't stress that enough. Like I've heard it before. I've heard these unicorns. Like I, I read the Clavio guys founding stories. Somehow it doesn't feel like it applies to me. I don't know. Yeah, But the fact that I was just sitting in the office, these dudes didn't go to Stanford. They're from fucking Maryland, right? Like they're normal guys. Like they, they were all, you know, making a hundred grand salary and living in small houses in the South of Austin and like complaining about how their wives like feel like they haven't been paid yet. Right. Like that was the, like they were contemplating selling their proof for $2 million and starting a restaurant. <laughs> Right. Like th this is who these guys were right before this happened. And watching it made me realize what was possible in the world. And it's mm -hmm. totally changed my outlook on everything. Just being there and seeing that, yeah, it's which I think is like a really beautiful thing. You know, I like try to, we're doing a rebrand. I'm like, I want to capture that feeling in the words that we use on the website, you know, cause I think it's like, it's a great, I am now tethered to this in the way that I live my life, right? I truly believe that anyone can do anything. And if they think that they can't, I'm going to argue with them. And I'm going to tell them of what I watched these guys do and what I watched myself do, right? Like, 
I so, like so so by the way this this earnout that we had on this deal it was to end in on December 31st the target revenue level was 17.5 million by the end of next year and we weren't going to hit that like we're already at 20 now 9 months ahead Right. Like bare metric says we're at 17.5 or whatever, but like we have 3 million in onboarding. Like this is, it's like this thing is so much bigger and better and faster than anything that I thought I could ever do, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it started with them. We put a lot of other stuff in place, but uh, anyway. So, so, uh, and we stayed in touch on and off, but from, from that day in the loft, I, you know, I became a, you know, marketing professor in the graduate school of Tour University and got to work with MBAs and, you know, other marketing, talking about entrepreneurship. And one of the things I said to them is that if you, and this to anybody that I speak with, if your motivation on being an entrepreneur is to be rich, then don't bother because we know the numbers, right? 80%, yeah. whatever, you're going to fail. Yeah. That can't be the reason why you go into it. You, from a marketing perspective, you go in to solve a problem that's not been solved and differentiate for sure. But beyond that, and I don't want to go into the, you know, the overly beat up Simon Sinek, the why thing that everybody just regurgitates because it makes them sound sophisticated. Um, I'm curious about you because because this is a phenomenal story you just told. It's not about the money for you. What is driving you now? Because no. I got a glimpse of it in one of your posts, and I encourage anyone to follow you on, on LinkedIn on Adam Robbins because you've got these great five-minute videos that are so impactful. Yeah. I got, I think I got my answer in the last one you said. I think it was the older the new, right? And the, yeah, the, the old thing school that culture versus new school yeah. culture. And the thing that touched me yeah. is I think what's driving you, but I'm going to let you answer. It's not the money anymore, right? Uh, what is it? No, look. Having uh, some sort of large financial outcome at the end of this, like if that doesn't happen, I think that I will have left something on the table. Like, I think it's so special now that that's certainly a goal. I have no timing needs around that, you know, uh, my day to day I have zero financial motivation on a day-to-day -day basis, but like, you know, we're trying to create a unicorn here. Right. And like, it's, it's, it's life-changing if you can monetize that. Um, I love the game. I really do. You know, and, and I love this idea that you can create a company and you can, as the founder and CEO of it, lead this charge to energize your people in a similar way than an artist does. There's this book called, it's getting a lot of press right now. Rick Rubin wrote it, the music producer. It's called The Creative Act, A Way of Being. I would highly recommend anybody who's an entrepreneur read it. I found it gave a vocabulary to a part of business that uh, I had never read before. And he talks about how art is dealing in this world of energy and you're somehow harnessing energy from the universe and you're transferring it to this physical object and it is meant to have an emotional impact on the audience right mm -hmm. it's very abstract this is what i think i'm doing now <laughs> you know like our brand has gotten to a certain point where a lot of my role is this is what all of this content's about that i'm doing on linkedin it's like trying to just generate this like not too much, not too little, but this exact amount of excitement relative to the tra trajectory that we're on to where it's not going to disappoint anybody, but like it, it is invigorating and inspiring people and behaving in a way where, um, you know, it is generating this, you know, goodwill surplus between us and our employees and us and our partners and us and everybody else. Um, but I, I think it's, the most natural way to live is to live as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. it, it is very similar, I think, to being a tribal uh, community versus the forces of nature. At any point, I'm dealing with one right now, like you can get stormed by a pack of lions and absolutely eliminated, decimated. There is no second place ribbon. There is no, here's a trophy for participating. Like you're out. 
No, and, and that's what one of the things I loved about trading as well. It's like you will get absolutely destroyed if you're put in a position of weakness, you know. And I think it's a really natural way for a human being to live because it pushes you towards excellence. I read a quote this morning on this book that the proof guys have out there, Lince, Vince Lombardi on football. The most impactful quote that these players always say is, I believe that the quality of a man's life is directly proportional to his commitment to excellence in any endeavor he does. I think entrepreneurship pushes you towards excellence because if you are not excellent, you will not fucking survive, period. Mm -hmm. So I love being in that environment. Uh, there are so many variables. It's this dynamic creation that you're doing where you're building, your building blocks are people's lives. So if you think about that in terms of plants, right? Something like that, you can feed these plants in a way to where you put them in place and they grow on top of each other. You can also starve them in a way to where they wither away, right? So um, I just love being able to be in the middle of all of this. And uh, there's something very beautiful about the position we're in right now and the impermanence of it. Like we, we, there's this very clear road ahead to a certain size company that will be very valuable. Once we get there, it's not going to be as fun. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a, a lot harder to get people excited about it, right? Because it's I show anybody where we're at, our market penetration, how fast we're closing deals. So they're like, holy shit, like you're going to be the size of Clavio, you know? Um, mm -hmm. We don't have any competitors, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you gave me a billion dollars today, I'd still come in tomorrow. I wouldn't change anything about, you know, it's like very unreal. There are no, the, this is, uh, it's just, I feel very lucky to have found. It's like the opposite of the burnout that I was feeling with Robley. Um, but it's like a total commitment and being fully in it. That is, that makes it so satisfying, I think. Yeah. And look, there, there's a, there's an, and I, I want to end with that where there is an aspect to our conversation that we didn't spend time on, but it's built in and it, and it's part of your success story. And I was going to say it before I didn't want to interrupt you is that you, you said, I love the game, but I think you love the players more, meaning yes. you wouldn't have been able to go travel the world, go to Argentina and, Last time I saw you were some island. God knows, I don't, I don't know where you were. <laughs> I'm not remember. gonna talk. I'm not yeah. gonna talk about that. But anyway, um, you wouldn't be able to do this unless you have a great team in place, and that's the key to entrepreneurship. And when you read your old versus new, what what I get from you is what's driving you now is really is making life better for other people, whether it's your employees, your affiliates, whoever your strategic partners. It's really it's not about you anymore. Which and maybe, and that's my kind of last question for you. How did having a kid now? How old is your child? It's three? seven months. We're very seven months. Very, yeah, we're very fresh. So 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 does that did that change anything for you in, in terms of what you're doing? Man, it just it's crazy because it just happened at the same time that all of everything about my business changed at the same time this kid was born. So they're just happening in parallel, these things that I've read about, you know, you, you can never experience what either one of them are like until you're in the middle of it. Um, but, but it's, but it's different for you because look, business is a baby, right? right. Probably was a baby, you know, retention's a baby, but when this thing, somebody hands you this thing in a delivery room, it, it does, it, it does have a profound totally. impact, right? I mean, it's like, sure. holy crap, I'm a dad now. Mm -hmm. It's like, so yeah, 100%. All right. um, Adam, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for spending that much time with me. This was amazing. Uh, we could probably spend another hour and a half on about other lessons, but uh, thank you so much. I'm look, who is it for me to say I'm super proud of what you have achieved, but honestly, I I've always liked you from the loft days and how you treated the people there in the, in the apartment, in the loft. You're always very gracious. And, you know, I think good things happen to good people. And I think, you're one of those. And um, I'm happy that I know you. That's that's how I can well, end this. Well, likewise. And thank you very much. I'm I'm just so glad we got to catch back up. And Absolutely. You know. And tell Dave, miss it. listen, his stuff is awesome. Um, yeah. I can't believe you know Dave. I was like, I <laughs> he's, he's, look, he's amazing. He's amazing. I, yeah. I, I 
I slapped founders of SaaS founders around so much because I said, stop chasing, about what we use terminology, usually I stop my guests and say, AR is annual recurring revenue, which is a term for subscriptions. Mm -hmm. And the, the SaaS founders that I work with, and they all make the same mistake, they say, stop chasing new subscriptions. Churn is killing you. You're yeah. not paying attention to your existing subscribers. Talk to them, make sure that they log in, that they use it. And if they don't, ask them why. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, they just don't do it. They just chase that magic, yeah. you know, number that you can sell it off. So anyway, Adam, amazing. I'm going to stay in touch. I'm not letting you run away and I'll, I'll keep watching you do more amazing things. Great. Thanks for having me. Same here. Take care. Bye. Bye.